And we are live. Welcome to another episode of the Freudenfreude Weekly Podcast. Live, vlog, whatever you call it. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everybody. I want to ask for your support to like today I've been so busy setting up stuff that I apologize. It just looks terrible, but I promise it would look better next time. Okay. There it goes. That's the, beauty the of, that's the beauty of live people, right? I mean, if your computer's down, your computer's down. Yes. And if you have a bad day, hair day like me here, there you go, that's like... also, also part of the reality. So let's just take yes. it as right. Okay. So this, this channel, we hope to provide you content that helps you grow as a person and as a leader. Yes, absolutely. And I am Sandra Corona. And I am Claudia from Luxembourg. And I am a coach uh, for profession. Oh, wait, oh. yes. Oh my God, I got ahead of myself. Okay, and we are- We are coaches. coaches. Okay, got it. It's <laughs> kind of one of those episodes, but go ahead. Okay. You are a coach for? I am a coach for uh, young professionals for expatriate leaders and for expatriates moving around the world anywhere you go. Well, there you go. And I am a coach working with entrepreneurs, corporate leaders, as well as their teams in tech and beyond. And believe it or not, that also evolves working all across the world. So there we go. Today, we have an interesting topic. And if I were to remember the exact wording that we used for it, Yes. Um, that would be helpful. What is the exact wording? It was for okay. So for everybody, while Claudia is looking for that, <laughs> I want everybody to know that this was a freaking realization. I have to say freaking because when you're doing your everyday and you're doing things as an expat, you don't realize how you partition your body. And, and I say it literally you partition your, your mind, your body, and your soul, meaning the heart. And you don't see, you have to wait for your body, your mind, and your soul to catch up for in order for you to adapt. And when Claudia was telling me this this morning, I was like, I even had to tell her, wait a minute, I'm having a moment because she had a moment she did have because a i did have a moment it was impressive the way that she she told me um you know when you are in a in a change it doesn't have to be an expectation but when you are processing a change you put your entire body into it please claudia can you can you tell people exactly what words did you use that it was just a realization I hope people have it well I actually looked up the gentleman's name uh, I learned about him in a German uh, a personal uh, personal uh, coach and business coach uh, certification that I did mm -hmm. And uh, the gentleman who came up with this is called Raphael Bonelli, probably of Italian origin. And uh, he came up with the psychological model. He was a neurologist, psychologist, psychiatrist, something. He was a medical person. Okay. Came up with this model that uh, you can think of a person essentially uh, as, as having three parts. The mm. first one's the brain, cognitive brain, the thinking brain. We're all very familiar with that. Mm. And then we have the gut, the gut mm. being the seed of our emotions and uh, our feelings and emotions live over there. And right in the middle, kind of as this link between the two, you have your heart and your heart would be kind of your moral compass in all of this, linking the two together. Mm -hmm. And that would also then be the seat for your personal values and your, your integration of how you perceive culture and so on. So uh, it, it, is, it is 
uh, just the character would also be part of the heart. Mm -hmm. And what we what we what we talked about was that um, because uh, Sandra had suggested a topic title for this yes. that yes. was very emotion. It's like. Mm -hmm feeling that we don't belong, something like that. Yeah. And yeah. yet, as she was trying to explain to me why she, she suggested this topic, I'm like, but the things that you mentioned to me now, as you explain your choice, are very tactical, logistical, brain-related checklist kind of things of how you integrate and how you use language and how you deal with different culture thingies and so on. And I, I mentioned to her that there was really, that they were not the same. That, you know, we interact really on these three things. We have our raw emotions that come across and, and, to, and our uncertainties and our, and our subconscious kind of uh, heuristics and biases and all these kind of things play into how we how we integrate, how we deal with a change in culture. And let's just assume that somebody is expatriating and has like this overwhelming change of culture. But this also applies on smaller scale, I think, as, as people, uh, you know, move from culture group to culture group in their usual environment. Yeah. Right. So right. you have right. a changed culture. So you have all these emotional and subconscious things happening under the surface in this model in your gut. Right. Yep. And then you have all your thoughts, your, your cognition happening that you're aware of. You know, I see this, I decide that and so on, which is really your, your thinking brain. Yes. And then in the middle, you kind of have this question mark, um, which is really how do we put the thinking thing and the, the, the feeling body into a, an aligned whole that then can make a decision that is literally in alignment with who we are. Yeah, alignment with who we are. And so that gave uh, our poor Sandra a moment this morning. Can you maybe maybe talk a little bit more about why this was such an epiphany for you? Okay, so I had talked before about ADHD where, you know, when you are writing about stuff, usually it's about connecting the mind with, let's say, with your arm right? When you're writing, there's emotion and the emotion is here. It lives here in your arms. And I don't know why, but that's how a lot of ADHD people see it. It's not about the heart. It's, it's not about emotions. It's about how you express your emotions. And that's usually through writing if you're left-handed right-handed, whatever. And it made sense to me when I was explaining this to my clients. Ever. When Claudia said what she said, what she explained to all of you, it was like, a, it made complete sense where I said, it seems that ADHD people and all the people around the world experience the same emotion except that they connect the heart where they say it first goes here it goes here and then it goes here or the other way around right ideally it goes the other way around where the gut is connected to the heart and the heart tells the, the brain this is how you should behave that's really what you're expecting expecting to do but in our case as ADHDers we go brain, heart, and gut. And then we understand. And it goes like up and down, up and down. That's how we function. Okay. And when she said that, I was like, oh, my God. I only thought that it was just us that functioned that way. And it was just, it was just a realization. It was just this thing where you would say, it's incredible to realize that 
people, anywhere you go, whoever you talk to, there's always this emotion right here, especially when there's differences, right? When there's a difference, you always have this here in your gut. You never realize that it's coming in your gut. You always think that it's your brain that is making you make these decisions or no, no, no. It's always in your gut. It always starts here. And until you put it in your heart, you think, okay, what am I thinking? What am I doing? What, what, why do I feel this way? And then your brain understands that. And then you're like, okay, okay, wait right, a second. And that's when logic, logic comes into play. And then you understand yourself and blah, blah, blah. And then you react in a better way, blah, blah. It's just different. I swear to God, it was just different because I was used to doing it the other way, right? Where you think it processed, this person did this to me, I felt this, and now I need to react this way. Well, I, just, I think that, that there's not necessarily a right or wrong way of no, doing it. Because, no. Because the, these, these gut things uh i think they these instinctual things these these um, you know amygdala uh reptilian brain uh, first impressions that kind of trigger that uh they you know i think that they are there instantly i i, I think that they are normal they are people long, long, no 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 i think that they are they are long before any kind of thought happens because but but I think okay. that it, it has to do with the order in which we perceive them and become conscious of them. Okay. Conscious of them. Yeah. And and so there's no right or wrong reason. There's no way that says, well, you know, gut needs to come first. So I need to consider gut before brain. It doesn't really work that way. I think that for me, the lesson in this would be is not to regard either one. Okay. Not to disregard either one. Either one has important information. So let's, let's take this in the context of somebody who might be very task-oriented person. Yeah, very task oriented. Okay. You are and, very task oriented. <laughs> I am. I am actually both task and people oriented. I am on the lucky one of the, the lucky ones that can kind of do both. But in That's any good. case, you you. I'm very analytical. Let's say it that that I would agree with. So you get put a task. You need to emigrate to country X Y Z, uh -huh. and so that uh, problem, you know. For many people, including myself, it would be, oh, I need to get the passport. I need to get this. I need to learn the language. I need to get health insurance over there. I have to, you know, register with the yeah. government, mm -hmm. all these kind of mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. And many people, I think, would think that that would take care of them being okay. Okay. To go. Because they would all of a sudden disregard everything else. It's stuff like, uh, nope, your camera was better before. Move it up a bit. Oh, really? Okay. Like that? Yeah. Thank okay. You. Perfect. Uh, so um, it would then be, you know, am I uncomfortable? Am I scared? Uh, am I prejudiced? Do, do I maybe have some biases against that particular country and it's really not attractive to me? Um, you know, what will my family think? What will this do to my career? Uh, you know, all these things all of a sudden come into play. And if you focus too much on the how, you're going to do this on the tasks you have to complete to actually do it on the logistics of it. I think that there's, there's all this inner turmoil uh, is maybe not getting the attention that it needs. And I said turmoil for a reason. 
uh, turmoil is kind of a not so good word. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, but, but that is true. Um, in this case, changing culture groups or expatriating is in its very nature a change and a loss of reference. It really is. It's a, you lose your normal parameters and you get thrown in a different culture. And yes. that is not easy to do for everybody. There's exactly. some people that, that have much more, you know, oh, you know, I come it, I take it as it comes and I'm going to just like, you know, wing it and, you know, I'm good. Yeah. And, right. I'm perceptive. So I'm going to be fine. But that's not everybody. That yep, is yep. not everybody. And, and yep. so, there, nevertheless, on how you're actually manifested in the end, there is turmoil because there is change. Yes. People are more yes. resilient than others to change. And yep. that's okay. Yep. Yep. So I think that um, one of the reasons actually why having a coach when you go through a large transition like this is not a bad idea. And a lot of companies nowadays provide coaching to people that get expatriated, especially into cultures that are very foreign and very many di different dimensions to your own. Yes, right? correct, I, correct. I would assume that if, if a Korean needs to go to Japan, might be a different kind of a thing than if an American goes to Japan or, yes. or an, mm. go to China or something, right? Mm. Or, so, mm. so there's sometimes the differences between countries is smaller or larger. But if yes. you get thrown into a complete different soup, it's tough to swim. Yes, that is correct. That is very true. And, you know, it, it, the reason why I proposed the original topic is because I was thinking about how people, when you arrive, you don't realize this. You think you're going to continue doing your thing. You're going to continue uh, dressing like you dress and doing the things that you do and talk to people the way that you do and, and so on and so on. But then when you realize that there's a problem, somehow somebody tells you there's a problem and you're like, why? I'm acting the same way. I'm doing the same things that I used to do and, and so on and so on. You realize that the culture doesn't take very well in you talking with a senior position about something. Let's say, let's talk about Japan. Japan is one of the clearest examples about um, uh, talking about uh, senior positions and so on. High, and so high, on, right? how, high, high power distance. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And so you're here thinking, well, I'm a senior, but yet you're 35 years old. And then you're talking with a senior that is 65 years old. No. <laughs> right. No, it doesn't mean a single thing. You should be with your 30 somethings, the people that are, that should be addressing the 60 somethings should comply with certain aspects, should be doing certain things, and should be within the age range. It is so surprising to realize these kind of things. And it is surprising yes. to us, let's say, Ex to people yes. that, didn't, that didn't grow up there, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Especially yeah. country, there are certain countries, like a lot of the uh, Slavic countries, for instance, or like, uh, I don't know, Finland or whatever that have, don't quote me, I might be off, but they have very flat hierarchies. It's very open. It's very flat. Yeah. And, and yeah. so you can, you can definitely, you know, like be quite casual with your boss or your boss's boss. Right. In, uh, but in yeah. certain cultures, that would be terrible. You cannot yes. be in a, in a, your whole team goes to a restaurant to celebrate something and you dare cross your legs 
you know, which is like, how can you cross your legs when there are more senior people in the room that are not? And so on. It's, it's, yes. it's really, it's really, it's not good or bad. It's different. It's different. And so exactly. if, if, if you are not done attuned to that, that there can be differences, you can yes. put your foot in it and potentially destroy your career without even realizing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. so I think that, see, the, the, during the expatriation, and we're using this again as an extreme example. Yes, um, correct. The, the most, that's the first people, the first place where most folks even understand culture. Because when mm. you're in your own culture, you're not aware of it. No, absolutely not. You just do things <laughs> the same way that you have always done them. And all of yes. a sudden you're like, this is not how things are done around here. Oh my God. Yes. And how are they done Correct. around here? And I can't understand why it's different. Yes. Correct. Correct. Yeah? Correct. Exactly. Imagine a Japanese that they're usually very accustomed to just leaning over and expressing, you know, thank you, nice meeting you. This is their way of doing it. And then coming to, to the U.S. and doing the same thing when the person is stretching their arm, it's like, what is this person doing? So anyways, the point here is that belonging requires education, requires for pe to, people to be coached. That was my whole purpose. It was to say, you know what, sometimes what, let, you know, let me put the example when I arrived, I thought I'm going to continue doing that. I knew that there were certain limits like me needing to put on an abaya and you know, not looking at men. For, and those, stuff like that. for those that that do not know your context, where does it the first show? Maybe give a little bit of context. Yes. So sorry. Yes, I live currently in Saudi Arabia, and I've been living in this country now for almost nine years. And I was a global mobility partner for a chemical company where I was moving expats, people from all around the world to move here and do one of the biggest chemical projects here in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, you would hear people talk about how it was difficult for them to adjust and they would express their concerns. And can I take this? Can I do this? This and that. And it was, it was, I would say, I, I have to say, it was very frustrating for me to never have placed a foot in Saudi Arabia and to tell them, no, you can't do this. No, it's better for you to do that. And, you know, we have learned that this is not a good thing. And then later, once you're here, you realize it's not that bad. You know, you can actually do this kind of stuff. And blah, blah, blah. You know, anyways, in the moment, there was a lot of blockage. There was a lot of things that you couldn't do, blah, 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 and this and that. The point of all of this is that I would hear a lot of people say that they could or could not be, do these things. And I told my husband, before we moved to Saudi Arabia, Let's be aware that we could not bring these kind of books and we made sure we didn't bring, you know, religious books and books that contain probably something that was questionable and all this kind of stuff. Once you arrive here, you realize it wasn't that, that bad. It was, you know, it was, it's a country in progress. It's a country that tried to do things better. And as years have passed by, now, for example, I can tell you now I can drive. Now I can dress without an abaya. Now I can wear short sleeves. Now, you know, I can do a lot of things. But back then, you know, it was a matter of you being here in the country and, and experiencing the situation. But that's what you have to do. Yeah. That's really what you have to do. And I, I appreciate that you say that you need education. Yeah. Uh, however, I, you know, yes, you can read like the general 
you know, overview type things about a country and so on. That is one type of, situ of, of education and you can do that even before you go there. Another type of education is even being aware when something isn't quite right. And then going out and getting the answers to your questions. That for yeah. me is also a certain education. Yeah. If, but for you to figure out that things aren't quite right, you might need some of those gut instinct things. Yeah? yeah. It's not it's not necessarily like your brain that's going to jump to, oh, this is this is not working here. Sometimes yes. it's it's the it's the oh, the energy in the room just changed. Yes. Nobody exactly. said something, nobody looks at me. It doesn't <laughs> something ain't right. So what yes. did I do now? What did I do now? And, yes. and hopefully you, you'll be able to, to use this antenna because I think that that you have to have your awareness up at full volume yes. when you when you do something like that. It can be very tiring, yes. by the way. Yeah, mm -hmm. just just to really like gauge by the reactions of others whether you are behaving correctly because that's yes. the you're gonna get. Yeah? yeah, and if you can if you can pick up on the on the on the small things quickly, you can address the small things quickly and hopefully yeah. avoid the big problems where they like you know get machine guns and walk you out the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, okay. So, so uh -huh. Just, just saying, right? Just say, and and it um, it it again comes to the thing that culture has written rules, and unwritten rules. Okay. There's, Correct. They are very explicit, and you can find them in the textbook, and they give them to you at the uh, embassy of that country, maybe, right? Mm -hmm. Like the do's and don'ts, yep. and so on. But then there's so much other stuff that goes on uh, that is not written anywhere. Yes, anywhere. yes, yes. And Correct. also, Correct. take it from me, I've lived in different places as well. Uh, take yeah. it from me that at least half the jokes you're not going to get. <laughs> yes, exactly. Don't feel I, bad about it. You can always yeah, can't, yeah, can't, can't, can't get the jokes <laughs> because there's so much insider knowledge that that is yeah. required on there. Um, you know that that uh, you know is it, it's, it's just lost on you. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, the first thing I remember uh, that I, I I emigrated at some point to the USA uh, from Europe. And there was always this thing. I, I, I felt like, why do people always make fun of policemen when they have a stain here in front of their blouse or maybe some donut powder and stuff like that? It's because yeah. it's based on a cliche and of, of you know, of the, the disinterested policemen always eating donuts and, you know, just not doing any work. And that's doing those poor policemen such a disservice because frankly, it ain't like that. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it has, it, you know, so there's, there's donut dust jokes in the US for the longest yes. time, I didn't get it. Yes. I didn't get mm -hmm. it. Just mm -hmm. a very, very simple, you know, uh, example. And I apologize that I chose that one to all the American policemen or policemen worldwide that were listening to this. Um, it, uh, you know, I have- No, no, no. As but you make work. a good point. You make a really freaking good point because just yesterday or the day before, I had a stain right here in one of my, my yoga pants, okay? I told my husband, this is the reason why they say that Americans never worry about their aspect, you know? Because I would just say, oh, it's just a gray stain and move on, right? But other people here, especially here in Saudi Arabia, you see people in perfect condition, but what I was telling my husband, but you never see what's under the abaya, which is the gown that women wear, right? And you could look like you've been working in a garage and everything else. But as long as you have your abaya on top, which is clean, and you look with all your makeup and all that kind of stuff, you look all put together, right? But that is not a, a, a thing that Americans do. We just don't 
look at the stain. We just assume immediately that this person has been busy, that this person has been doing stuff, and that's it. That's it. But that's why I was saying you have a good point. It's, it's this thing that we have culturally wise to say in our culture, aspect matters a lot. In this culture, aspect does not matter a lot. In this other culture, you're busy. You're doing stuff, right? And, and so again, to go about the written rules or unwritten rules, you might maybe not find, maybe you will, maybe you don't, but it's possible that, uh, or let's assume that in your written to, do, don't do list that you got from an embassy or picked up somewhere, that there is not written, make sure that you're always impeccably dressed. Yeah. Imagine it oh, is, yes. Yeah, right. So you go out and a stain has magically appeared on your clothing. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where, uh, what I mentioned before, you pick it up because other people give you the stink eye, <laughs> right? I was like, what? Look at her. <laughs> Look at her. How can she go out like that? Right? Yes. And that yeah. and <laughs> Right, and then you can go and say, well, something wasn't right. Maybe the evening yeah. as this robe, you mentioned that mm -hmm. you saw that there was a stain and that's when you go on the internet and you Google, you know, stain on clothing in XYZ country. Yeah. And then it's like somebody somewhere in this uh, beautiful internet universe is gonna have right, make sure you're impeccably dressed. And then you're like, okay. Oh, yes. Oh, okay, yes. I learned something yes. new, but that's yes. that's part of it. And and so anybody who's who's going needs to kind of be um, vigilant of yes. the reactions of others because it's yes. a learning process, and not everything is written in the pamphlets that you get. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. And and so for me, the, the need to adjust your whole being to a new culture is also just by dialing up your awareness. Because a lot of people are not necessarily self-aware and they're not in this practice, sorry, in this practice of being self-aware or other mm -hmm. aware as well, even though I think most people are other aware than self-aware, but beside the point, you have to, you can't just live on like completely oblivious to what's happening around you and to what's happening inside of you, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. so, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, there might be, like I said earlier, an energy shift in the room an energy shift in the room. You're not, That's nobody true. gives you the stink eye. Everybody is polite. Nobody says something, but you feel that something isn't quite right. All of a sudden there's yeah. a little tension in the air yeah. and you're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what is happening here, right? If you don't do that, if you don't sense that and try then to maybe take a, a person that you're a little bit more familiar with or whatever to decide and say like what did I do you know am I respectful enough you know did I make a faux pas um, then you know it's it, you won't be able to do that if you stay oblivious to all that and just stomp around like the elephant in the china shop you can make some real damage for yourself your company your reputation, the company's reputation. And so I think that um, that is part of your whole being all of a sudden becoming involved, not just your thinking brain. Yeah. 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 yeah that's true. That's true. And I think it's also cultural, Claudia, because I was thinking, for example, I was remembering or I was trying to remember when I moved from Mexico City to uh, Houston, Texas, and I'm not saying that it was um, recent. So I was, I was three months old, two months old when I moved to Miami. Then 10 years later, I moved back to Mexico City. That was an adjustment in itself. And then from Mexico City back, but to Houston, Texas. 
And what I remember about that is how many times I had to be reading the room that I would not understand what was going on, that I was very visceral, that I was very reactive. And, and, and this is because in some way, at some part of my life, being a part of high school, junior, well, junior high, high school and college, well, in this case, uni, you know, for me, it was a way of being in a certain way. And then when I moved to, to, to the United States, I was very visceral, I was very reactive. And everything, I would feel like I wanted to protect myself. I wanted to defend myself. And slowly but surely, you understand that you do not need to defend yourself all the time, that people are trying to help you. And there's an adjustment, right? So we go from gut to heart to try to understand people and then to brain to understand what's going on. And so when you move from one location to the other, the whole point is to tell people you don't move from one country to another mentally. You have to find a way for your brain to catch up with your heart and then with your body so that you can actually understand what you're experiencing, right? Because that was the whole point of this morning's conversation. When I realized I felt that way, I was partitioning myself. You know, I was feeling like this was my brain right here. This was my heart right here. And this was my body right here. And I, I saw them as individual parts. And then when you told me that, I was like, boom, everything came together. I was like, oh my God, that is very true. I have to be able to tell my body if you're suffering, if you're struggling, if you're going through something hard, take your time, understand the experience that you're going through, and then communicate it so that you can get what you need or what you want. And a lot of people don't do that. A lot of experts are always just here because they think it's all just here. No. No, exactly. no, it's no, no. Just, yeah. and, and I think that uh, all parts provide valid data points that go into the final decision of behavior, right? Yes. The, the, the gut perceives different things than the brain perceives. And uh, and I know I'm, I'm using different terminology than in the constrictivist model, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. We, we, we catch on to different things, and but you know, they're all part of the thing that we try to decipher. And mm -hmm. so they're valid data points. And uh, I think the more we allow each part to be represented, the more easily we can integrate it into, into a whole. And, and a validation, uh, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. But I, I actually want to share a little bit of my own experience in that um, I find that you can most of the time relax through all of this because you know the people of the country that you move to are not out to get you. Uh, <laughs> if you if you try your level best with a good intention uh, to integrate and to be respectful, if you make a faux pas, they will understand that it is a faux pas, and you probably didn't mean it. You know, and you probably didn't do it to hurt them or whatever, or to be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. But this positive intention needs to be there. And I think that one thing that can help with that as well is the uh, a certain level of vulnerability. Being able to say, for instance, to a guest family as you as you go in, or maybe you know some people that will be your neighbors. Let's say. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that to be able to tell them, you know, hello, I just moved here. I'm from XYZ country. This is a new culture for me. If I do something that might be construed as yes. not okay, please let me know. Yes. I, I do mean no disrespect. 
Uh, and oh, that's, that's actually one that really should be like one of your go-to sentences. Yes, I don't mean yes. any disrespect. And, yes. and uh, you know, please just go and, and allow me to, um, uh, to be here and learn and be, become part of, of your place here. All right. Correct. You're absolutely right, Claudia, because that's, I've seen so many videos out there about people, you know, especially, you know, the videos that I see a lot is people violating their, their lines, right? Their property lines. And I think about how many times people don't build a gate, thinking that what they're doing is giving their neighbor the respect that they deserve to own their 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 uh, individual individuality. I'm sorry, individuality and 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 uh, what's the other word? Um, uh, just you know, privacy. That's the word. Privacy. You're giving yourself and your neighbor privacy. But turns out that a lot of people hate that because they were not aware. Okay, number one. Number two, you did not discuss very clearly. And there is no detection about where your property starts and where theirs ends. And so they feel violated. And I've seen so many people fighting about this. There's destruction of gates and all this kind of stuff unnecessary things people don't communicate enough and 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 that is something that i've seen so much lately it it just seems like people don't want to talk anymore they they assume that people know this and you cannot assume anything anymore sadly there is no no understanding you cannot assume for people to understand what you're doing. Instead, you need to communicate and come together and say, are you okay that we're going to do this? Do you agree with this? You know, and so on. And then they go to court and all this kind of stuff. You're like, yeah, they get, they get stuck yeah, in this escalating, yes, escalating spiral. Yeah, of- when it could have just been this big. Right. And then, you know, we we continue to be neighbors. We respect each other. You just let me know when there's something wrong. And, you know, all that kind of communication is lost. And I feel so saddened when I see those kind of situations that could have been avoided if people talk with each other. Yeah. Well, I think that there's probably a couple things that play into this. Um, globa- globalization is very real. And, uh, you know, you can't be in Luxembourg here and walk three steps without, you know, uh, coming into, you know, bumping into a foreign of a completely different <laughs> ethnicity, uh, speaking or maybe not speaking any of the current languages here in the country. Yep. And, and so we, we are quite used to it. And it, it makes this fluidity of cultural boundaries much more flexible. It makes the, you know, I mean, it's, it's fluid and you, you just mm. know that you can't assume anything because mm. you know, you're, you're sitting at a table with five people, everybody has different cultural limits. And yes. so you just say, okay, well, to hell with all of them. Right, and you just you just engage human to human as much as possible. Mm-hmm. But I think that uh, also one thing to consider is when you go um, to a con- another country, you all of a sudden, as the expat, are becoming intensely aware of culture. Hmm? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Think back a couple of months when you were at home in your old culture; you were not aware of your culture oh no no and so and so uh, most people aren't actually because it's like the the fish isn't aware of the water that it swims in okay (laughs) so give give the the people of your host country the benefit of the doubt they do not know that you just ran into a cultural no-no that you Mm -hmm. have cultural dissonance happening in your brain that you do not understand 
because yes. for them it's it's stuff like usual and they can maybe not even understand how somebody else could not understand because it's so obvious to them it's yes. so obvious to them right yes yes and they're like, they're like, what how can that person even conceivably think that that's okay and yeah. you know, you're the expert yeah. doing all the wrong things and and you know you do not mean any disrespect but they are flabbergasted. Oh. they do not know mm -hmm. where it comes from mm -hmm. and let's also not forget that there's that there's countries on this planet that have a long history of conflict and war where any kind of aberrant behavior is going to be perceived subconsciously even as a threat. And yeah. so the emotions can run high unless you have kind of tried to, you know, make the thing uh, clear in the beginning. It would be so nice if expats mm -hmm. could have like a learner Alert yes, you can say I'm right. European. Be kind to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, be kind to me. That's right. true. It, it's it's like uh, you know how the cars here when you get a driving license, you have like a learner learner tag in the car, right? And it tells all the other cars that 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 person knows buckets about about driving. So let's keep our distance, and yeah. uh, that person is doing the best they can. And I wish that there was like a way that we could you know, identify ourselves as, as a foreigner that just doesn't know any better, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so there's, it's so, so complex. I mean, this is not you know, a problem. This is a complex one. And and so much goes into it. Uh, and, and if you can arm yourself, I think as an expat only with one thing, arm yourself with good intention and respect. Yes. But here's another thing that I wanted to mention, even as a local person that has been living overseas and comes back home, you can also experience the expat thing that people go through when they're going to, let's say, my experience going to the driver license place in Houston, Texas. I went there and I felt so freaking lost, Claudia. It just things did not make sense. I was like, why are they asking me to do this? Why do I have to do that? Why, do, you know, everything just felt so foreign. And now I understand how people, you know, when they're outside and how they see the U.S., it just seems this, this functional thing, but it's just that you're not used to the system. And, 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 even trying to ask somebody, I am so sorry. I feel lost. I don't understand what's going on. People are going to look at you like, wait, you speak English. You sound like me. Why are you so lost? And then, like you said, you know, you hope you, there was something here that says, I've been away from my country for so many years. Please be fish myself, you know, but no, people look at you and they say, you, you, you must be kidding, right? Really, there's an importance of people taking coaching or training on going to foreign assignments and even on vacation. Even on vacation, I was so surprised when I moved here to Saudi Arabia, when I went to my first vacation, how people perceive Americans. It's not good people, so don't ask. But, you know, you, you come to realize how, how people around the world see one culture, see another, and so on and so on. The point here is gut feelings are good for you to just listen to the alarms. And then you need to in order for you to not be some person going to the Capitol on January the 6th, doing what you do is you need to think with your heart and say, okay, what am I feeling? What's going on? And then put it in your, in your brain and say, okay, I don't need to be reactive. I understand that this is what's going on. I know that this is what I'm feeling. I know that these are my beliefs and so on and so on and so on. A smart person 
knows when to talk. A genius person knows the answer. So which one do you want to be? That's really the, the, the question for me here. When, when I was, when I heard Claudia tell me this morning, I was thinking, who do I want to be? Do I want to be the genius or do I want to be the smart person? I actually want to be the smart person because I want to be able to listen to people's conversation, understand what's going on. And then if somebody wants my response, I will respond. Otherwise, your opinion is not needed in everything, right? I, I think one thing that, that helps with all of this is really to become clear about your own assumptions. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, see, I, I got it out of the way. I cannot do that <laughs> without talking about assumption and expectation management. So, so it, it really is true. It's like being clear that when you have an opinion, which assumptions underlie that opinion? And then when you're in a different environment, still asking yourself, so do those assumptions still ring true? Are they still fulfilled? Is this thing that I decided or that I do or that opinion still valid, given that now maybe some of my assumptions might be violated? How do I need to adapt this? And granted, that is a very cognitive skill. But again, taking into account, you know, your self-knowledge, uh, your internal barometers, um, you know, and definitely also the, the instinctual uh, just feeling thing like, you know, this isn't quite right. You might not be able to put your finger on it exactly. And uh, that, that will happen quite a bit. But uh, actually what you just said earlier was the repatriation. Oh, my. <laughs> I came back to Luxembourg after, you know, over 20 years. Uh, I grew up here, I finished my high school here, and then left for university where I studied first in France, then in the US, and then I kind of got stuck in the US and worked in the US and Canada uh, before coming back, um, you know, about 12 years ago. And after 20 years, you don't recognize anything. You don't recognize anything. It's like nope. culture has changed. Um, uh, there, 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 were, there, there were things, I mean, I did come on vacation to visit my parents and things like that in, in the meantime, but you do not pick up on the subtleties. Uh, nope. really, really interesting things. And um, like whole cultures in countries can shift in that amount of time. Okay. For instance, yes. when, I, when I grew up, this this is a this is a, a minor example, but it nevertheless for me very profound. Uh, when I grew up, uh, I I grew up speaking my mother tongue, which is Luxembourgish, but it wasn't really a language that was written very much. Okay. So when you wrote a letter to somebody, you would very often write it in German because uh, Luxembourg is closer to Germanic than it is to, you know, French. And so it was, uh, that was always kind of the thing. You would then write the thing in, uh, German. in German. And the, the thing is that now st store signs are in Luxembourgish. Uh, you, you write, you know, Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday mm -hmm. in Luxembourgish. You do SMS or text messages, WhatsApp messages in Luxembourgish. And if you were to do it in French or in German, now it would be like, what? Right? I mean, if it is okay. to, to Luxembourgish speaking people, obviously, you know, okay. I, I speak French to some of them and English to some of them, right. but... You know, if it is a neighbor down the street that I know is, is speaks Luxembourgish and I were to write a thing in German, they would look at me like, what? My, You're Luxembourgish. I'm Luxembourgish. My, what are you talking about? Yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? You can send a German meme. You can send a French speaking GIF. <laughs> you can, you you get, can it's do all joke. that, right? right. But, but right. Like, the, the thing is in Luxembourgish. So nowadays, if you do not know Luxembourgish spelling, which is very complicated, by the way, you know, it's, it's not a good thing. You, okay. You know okay. 
Christmas. How do you say Merry Christmas in Luxembourgish? Say fire days because we would uh say Christmas. Say Christmas. Um, but we actually also here, weirdly enough, we would say happy holidays. Even though it's it's a it's a Roman Catholic country most of the way, but we kind of have like the sixth of January festivities, you know, the Christmas proper festivities, mm -hmm. New Year festivities. So it's always like happy holidays because they are oh, okay. okay. But but the, the thing is, you know, uh, it, it's like it, it it's really crazy um, and fundamental things that all of a sudden you go like, oh my god, like people write store signs in Luxembourgish and and yet you know you walk into the store and most of the time you do not get a Luxembourgish speaking attendant which is kind of not okay. so good. Oh, interesting okay there's too many okay. foreigners here so you might actually go to a gas station here to get gas and the attendant is German because we're on the German border here. If you if you do the same thing in the city, you might get a person who speaks French. And mm -hmm. even though they might have been doing that job for years, they have yet to learn the basic ways of saying hello mm -hmm. and thank you in Luxembourgish, which can be upsetting in its own way. But I digress, I digress. So uh, just to say that even if you repatriate it's like going into a new country if you have been gone for a long time. Yes. And, and even people that you were familiar with, if you come back after 20 odd years, they have evolved. Yeah. Yes. Do not, do, not, do not expect people to be the same. You will always have a core group of people that are kind of like your soulmates. You come back after 20 years and it's like you left yesterday. Right. There are some like that, but yeah. you know, a lot of them will maybe have married, gotten kids, gotten you know a different socioeconomic status. Yes, yeah, uh, and they acquire new ideas, new yes, right. new values, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. But on the other hand, one thing that I'm much more acutely aware than them changing is me having changed. That's a very amazing point yes right mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. as you as you take the step away from your uh, native culture let's say and you travel hither and thither and left and right and integrate here and integrate there and see the world when you come back to your little pile oh. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it's very different and and you might be more open-minded or you might be less you know by the book by the local yeah. book and you know you be you may even become kind of the, the, the you know exotic black sheep of the, of the town or something like that but <laughs> yeah. but it is it is what you make of it i really yes. think it's not a bug it's a feature it's okay to be different yes exactly and that is one of the things that i've been praying to God that I continue thinking the way that I'm thinking, the way that I've evolved, the way that I've been doing things, because honestly, this feels right for me. And I know that eventually, oh, Sorry. bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. I know that eventually the American culture is going to reach me and, and there's going to be this thing where I'm going to be fighting with the old Sandra with the new Sandra right because we all experience that thing and so some way somehow i really hope that i can remain the person that i am today because this is the person that i like this is a person that has her value straight has her belief straight has um high, her ideals straight everything just looks good but once I go back to the to the United States, I know I'm going to change. I know there's going to be things that I'm going to judge. I know that I'm going to go back probably to the person that I was before. You cannot sometimes avoid that. But what matters is that you check yourself 
before you wreck yourself, right? There was a sign that said that. <laughs> I love check, that one. Right? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. And so this is my purpose. Uh, that was the whole intention of, of, of today's uh, topic, right? To tell people, you know, if this is what you liked, if this is what you embraced, make sure that nobody comes to you and tells you, are you sure this is what you want to do? Are you sure? Because so and so. What people do and what people behave is not your thing. That's one of the most important things. You are you and you have acquired, you have changed. For good or bad, that's another thing, right? Hopefully it's been for the good. Um, but anyways, that was my, my, my reason for today's topic. I even can't remember what it was. But when Claudia told me all of this about this German guy that said, you put your heart, your mind, your, your, your gut into it. And I was like, oh, my God, that is so very true. You know, you have to really put yourself in that place. Otherwise, otherwise you miss a whole purpose of adaptation because all you're doing is faking until you make it. If you don't put your entire body into that adaptation purpose or uh, how would you put it, Claudia? Yeah, I, I think we have to remain our whole selves um, and remain also true to ourselves as we go there always again in, you know, truly in the perception of the feedback that's constantly mm -hmm. given to us uh, by the culture, by the people. And um, again, if, if I had just to, to say one thing that transcends all of the faux pas that are, that are definitely going to happen, you, you can't avoid all of them, right? Mm -hmm. It is to just uh, be open. And very often, if you don't make a drama out of it, others won't either. And that is specifically towards asking a question, right? Don't think Wonderful. asking mm -hmm. a question is making you stupid. Mm -hmm. look stupid. Mm -hmm. Asking a question is making you look interested. Big, mm -hmm. big difference here. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I'm new here. Um, you know, how yeah. does this work? <laughs> And, and yep, that's exactly you are new, you don't know how it works. So. Correct, correct. Very well said, Claudia. Love that. Love so, that. positive intention, respect, a bit of vulnerability, and you're going to be all set. Listen to your gut, listen to your heart, mingle it all together in your cognitive brain. Yes. And yes. get a coach. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah get a coach yes that is very true yeah. thank, yeah. You very it, thank, for, you, thank for, you thank you for people that are not very self-aware self-reflected this can be a tricky journey to do all those things that we make to seem all like easy peasy here okay uh so soul searching like that might be the first time that people do it and a coach definitely can help with that absolutely so, absolutely did we, cover, did we cover everything you wanted to cover I think you've covered more than enough. Thank you so much, Claudia. I appreciate yeah, it. Good, good job. So everybody, thank you for listening. If you have anything to share about this topic, let us know. Put it in the comments. Uh, we would love to hear your, your insights, read your, read your anecdotes, uh, and maybe talk about some of them in future shows. I uh, Also, if you want to show us some love, please subscribe to the channel. Click that notification button. Yes. So you any content and we will be back to you next week yes absolutely and thank you so much everybody for putting up for this image but really it's all for the purpose of improving thank you so much claudia thank you everybody yes, else yes, yes. okay take care bye-bye bye, -bye. Claudia, bye. <laughs>